You can, you can hear me fine. Oh, hello. Hey. Hey. That, that reminds me, actually, um, they can't hear me online when I don't have this. So let me take this opportunity right now. I want to look straight into the camera for a second. And I want to I talk to everybody listening on Facebook. I want to talk to everybody listening on YouTube or in the future, wherever this message is going. I want to let you know, everybody listening online, that you're a valued member of this community. That maybe you, you didn't feel you had what it took to, to be here this morning. Uh, I have no idea why, because we'll welcome you just the way you are. You belong be, before you believe. And um, I just want to let you know that we love you, and we're glad you're here. Go ahead and ask any questions you have online, and we'll get back to you just as soon as we can. Come on, church. Give it up for your online family one time. See that? They love you. See that? All right. See what I did there? That was fun, right? Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right, go ahead and turn in your Bibles. If you got one of these bad boys right here, look at this triumphant-looking Bible right here. Look how thick and gold it is. Isn't that fun? I like that. It's uh, the book of Matthew is where we're going to spend most of our time. It's about, about there. It's about two-thirds. That's Micah, a little bit further. Mark. Oh, too far. Anyways, it's about two-thirds through the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew was a tax collector and a sinner. Everybody hated him, but it seemed like Jesus liked him, so that's what counts. Amen. Um, and by the way, if you've got uh, an iPhone or an even better Samsung uh, Galaxy, whatever you got, whatever you got, hey, now easy, easy, please slow down. All right? Don't, don't, don't shoot the preacher. Um, um, you can get your Version Bible app on your phone. Uh, it's a little brown looking. The Bible actually kind of looks like this, except it's a little square shaped like an app. And you can get the YouVersion Bible app. What I love about that app is that it helps us get into our word a little bit. It's got Bible plans in there, and you can set it to remind you. I love technology that helps me do what I really want to do. That's what I really like. I don't like technology that's like taking me off course and stuff, but YouVersion, that you can actually set that to remind you to, to, to be in your word even more, and I, I love that app. So go ahead and get, if you don't have that yet, and if you're struggling getting in your word every day, I would encourage you, man, just get on there. You'll love it. And also, just so happens that we have all of our notes in there. So if you're listening to this message right now, which all of you are, um, you can go on that app, and you can find Lifeline Church in that app under the events tab, and you can, like, follow along with all the scriptures that we have. All you got to do is, and everybody's used to it already, y'all here, and you're good to go. It's like... I'm trying to make it easy for you, and, and we don't apologize for that. So you can get on there, and you can follow along. I got this scripture right here, 1 Peter 3, and the title of my message is called Preach It. Preach It. Come on, say it with me. Preach It. Come on, say it like you really want me to. Preach It. Come on, preacher, preach It. Preach it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You got to say it with a little bit of... If you don't say it with your head going like this, you didn't mean it. Preach It. Preach It. Matter of fact... Um, uh, so funny. Gosh, you guys. It's, we're in church, guys. Shh, just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Um, it's really funny. Actually, uh, preach it. Um, it's funny when, I, when people call me preacher. It really throws me off. It really messes me up. And uh, I told this the last service, so it wouldn't be fair if I didn't tell you. There's a, there's a guy who owns the apartment complexes right here. I forget his name right now. Maybe it's better that I forgot his name. That's all right. I won't say it. Um, <laughs> But I go over there, like, so they just move somebody out of there, and I go over there to say hi to them, you know, because I, I want to be nice. I'm, I'm, I'm the nice guy from the church, you know. Hold on, let me get my button down going. I'm going to go right over there. Hello, sir. How's it going? I'm, and then he, he's, I'm not kidding. He stands there just like this, and he looks at me coming. He's like, and he, he looks at his helper. He looks at me. Here comes the preacher. <laughs> Here comes the preacher. Man, I was like, dang, man, I'm, I'm so sorry, right? I'm so sorry. Like, preach it. Hey, preach it, preacher. He, 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 it wasn't a little bit like this. It was more like the eye roll. But anyways, that's the name of my message today, preach it. And uh, by the end of the day, I hope you realize that preaching is not just something that somebody who stands in front of a, one of these things does. It's something that we all do. First Peter chapter 3 goes like this, starting in verse 15. Always be prepared to give an answer. To give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, I got a question for you. Show of hands if you believe and follow Jesus. Okay, all right. So like 90%, that's all right. Hey, and by the way, if you're here and that's not you, I'm really glad you're here. 
Because that means we're actually an inviting place that people who are on a spiritual journey, not sure where they're going yet, can still feel comfortable to be here. Say amen to that. Amen. Amen. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. We've created a space online for people, but people that come that not following Jesus yet come into our come into our experience here. And that's I think that's really great. And I'm I'm so glad to be a part of that journey with you. So you believe in Jesus. So let me ask you a follow-up question. Are you ready to preach? I got like five hands. That's all good. More as, as I, the longer I wait, the more hands go up. All right. There's some of you here. There's like six of you, six of you ready to preach. I love that. But according to the Bible, every single person who said they believe in Jesus should be ready to give an account. That's what, that's what this Bible says. So I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, if that's what it says, then maybe we ought to think about what it, what, what that means, what that means. So we're in a series called Unchained right now, Unchained. And it's all about when, when I align, let's just, Let's just put it in the first person here. When I align my life to this word, to what the Bible says to do, when I align my life to it, not align it to match my preferences, but when I align myself to this word, there's no chain that can bind me. There's no, every bad thing that could ever happen to me isn't bad, really. There's no chain that could bind me, and that's the premise of this whole series we've been in. This is the last week of it, that when we align ourselves to the Word of God, there's no chain that can bind us. And this is what Paul said to his disciple Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, and because I preach this good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal have been chained like a criminal. Just for talking about my Bible, I've been chained like a criminal. And that's, that's alive and well today in our world. That happens. That happens. But the word of God cannot be chained, he said. You know what that means? That when I'm living this thing the way I know it says to live my life, it doesn't matter. I got a story to illustrate this. This, this happened to me in my, in my life, and it has to do with real jail. I mean, you know, you got a, you got a pastor with a past right now. You're listening to a pastor with a past, and I've actually done time, and I'm about to tell you about it. Now, 11 years ago, it was 2007, um, I caught a big um, case because I wasn't, I wasn't following God, obviously. I hope that's obvious. I wasn't following God, and I was living for myself, and I was using drugs, and I was, you know, uh, drinking and smoking and doing just everything I could possibly do to just have fun. You know, I'm a rock and roll guy. I liked rock and roll, played drums my whole life, and it got me into a ton of trouble. And when I got into the Salvation Army in 2007, I was a hot mess. Everybody say hot mess. Hot mess. Point your finger at me. Hot mess. Hot mess. Not now. <laughs> now. Back then. Back then I was a hot mess. And when I got there, when I got there, um, I, was, I was shared the word. They shared the word of God with me. They shared what the Bible said about my life. See, this is what, this is what they did. They, they loved me right when I came in. And I was... I was foul, okay? I was, a, I was a mess. They had no reason to love me, no reason to care about me, but some people have given their whole lives to just receiving idiots and smelly, dirty dirt bags that have done terrible things. And that's all they do is they take you in and like they love you right like that. But they loved me so much, they thought I could change some things in my life so that I wouldn't be suffering anymore. But this is what happened. This is what happened. And this is what it's like to live unchained. I was, I, I was sentenced to 12 months in a program. Everybody tracking with me? I was sentenced to 12 months. I had already done nine months in jail, and I was sentenced to 12 months in a program. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I needed every day of it. Somebody was like, you needed that. All right. I was in there, and I was in there six months, and um, something started to change. See, I went on an overnight pass, and and what I was supposed to do is I was supposed to get my meeting card signed. What that means is I was supposed to go to an AA meeting, and I went on an overnight pass. And instead of getting it signed, I signed it myself, which was a major infraction at the time. You know how we do. When something doesn't, when we don't like something, we roll our eyes at it and think it's stupid. But, you know, I came back. I was six months into my program. So by the, it's a six-month program standard. I had double what regular was. I had a big case. And so I was six months in, almost everybody there was looking up to, I was the dock foreman, which means I was the, the guy in charge of the warehouse, and I, was, I had my own meeting. So I came home from my overnight pass, and I had my own meeting. I was in charge of it. I was sitting in the center at the front. I was leading the meeting, and I put my falsified card to my co-secretary, or whatever the title was, gave it to him, and he looks at my card and said, hey, Elliot, you went to a meeting at home? And I looked at him like, you know the look. I'm like, 
mind your business. Mind your business. <laughs> if, if, if it said I went to a meeting, then I must have. No, I didn't say that. I said, yeah, I went to a meeting. And then he, he went, cool. Did you see anybody you knew there? I'm like, dude, what is with all the questions right now? <laughs> this guy is like pushing my buttons. I'm like, no, I didn't see anybody that I knew there. I didn't see anybody. I didn't go to a meeting. I lied about it. And he said, man, that's so cool. There's no good meetings where I'm from. I'm so glad you got to do that. And right there, something happened in my heart. I knew what I was doing was wrong. Something shifted inside of me to where I wasn't just trying to do something to get through it. You know, some people come to church and they're like, well, check. You know, I did it. I did it. So I just did my deal. Like, I wasn't trying to do this program just to get it out of my way. My life was in a place where I wanted change. I wanted my life to change. I didn't want to live the same old life I'd always been living. And I thought to myself, why am I still doing this stuff? See, coming to church doesn't make, doesn't make your life all better. Doing the things we talk about in church is what makes the difference. And I started to get that before I'd even step foot in a church. And so you know what I did? I went and told on myself. <laughs> I went and told on my own self. I went to the resident manager's office and said, hey, look, see this signature right here? I did that. He said, that's, that's really bold of you to come in here and tell me you did that. I got booted. You know what I had to do for that? Three months in jail for signing my own card. I went three months in jail. But you know what? You know what, you know what happened? Even though I was in chains, I was the freest man in that place. I was the freest man in that place because no chain could bind me anymore. It's like, throw whatever you got at me. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm living my life according to this, and I am as free as I have ever been in my entire life. Three months, make it six. I don't care. I don't care because I, something shifted inside of me where it wasn't about just getting through the, the, the deal. I wasn't about checking off the box anymore. It was about living my life for this thing. And at that moment, what Paul said made sense. Even though I am sitting here bound like a criminal in chains, the word of God is never changed. And when I live my life with integrity and generosity and purpose and kindness, living for others and not myself, there's no chain. There's no chain. Put me in jail. I ain't chained there. Put me in actual chains. I'm not chained. I'm just going to talk to you about Jesus. So you can't chain me. You could kill me, and I'm unchained. You could kill me, and that would be the greatest release I could ever have. That's what, this, that's what this message is all about. That's what this whole series has been all about. That once you get that, once we get this, it's, like it's being set free. This, this word, it's not just a, a, a book with advice. It's not just a book with some tips and tricks to kind of skate through. It's a whole overhaul that changes our whole outlook on everything. I'm using, I'm using this kind of language on purpose because it's big time that you could be coming to church for 20 years and never do this. You could be coming to church for 35 years and never really do this. But you could come on your first day and say, you know what? I'm changing everything. I ain't living it. I, you, could be, you could be rich and still have this problem. You could be rich. You could have everything in the world. Ten cars, big house, uh, barely working. I retired at 35 and still have this big gaping hole in your heart. Like, man, I'm just, I'm living my life chained. I'm chained and I'm the freest person in all of Lodi. I'm the freest person in all of Lodi, all of San Joaquin. I'm living the high life. But how come I feel like I'm in my own little prison here? Why? What is that? It's all right here. It's all right here. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. That's why when we don't have him, we don't have anything. And that's why when we do have him, there's no chain. There's no chain. There's no chain that can bind us. But I did actually prepare a message today. So let me get to that. Let me get to that really fast. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, preach it. Preach it. Whoa, yeah. Oh my goodness, <laughs> you guys are bringing it out of me. Okay, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, goodness gracious, preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage. Did you see all that? Correct. Correcting isn't usually the nice thing to do. Correcting is like, get away from me with all that. Correct. Rebuke. Rebuke is even a harsher term than correct. Rebuking is like, 
uh, rebuke and encourage and encourage your people with good teaching. Paul is saying this to a pastor of a church, but I, he's also saying it to me and he's also saying it to you. Be ready in and out of season to preach what to preach what this word says. Be ready. I don't care if this is your first time in church. I don't care if this is your if if you're if you're barely started following Jesus. Um, you have something to offer somebody else. And you you have something to give. So Paul is talking to every single one of us today. Be ready, man. Be ready in and out of season. Be ready to give away what you have. That's the only real way to keep it is to give away what you have. Let me talk to you a little bit about what good preaching is like. I got five things in your bulletin that good preaching is like. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got you off guard that time. Thank you so lively. Good preaching is like a conversation. Good preaching is like a conversation. Okay, let me show you how. A good conversation lowers defenses and connects people to the heart. So you see how I try as my best to walk away from this thing and I, and I try and look at you while I'm talking is because I'm not, I'm not really trying to talk at you as much as I'm trying to talk with you. Let's just give that baby a kiss. That's all right. Come on. We love you. We love you. We love you just the way you are. Just the way you are. I'm not trying to talk at you. I want to talk with you because a conversation is what is what Jesus did. That's the way Jesus did it. Is he, 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 he told stories. Man, he had conversations with people, and people loved it. So if you want to really get good at, at giving your faith away, learn how to be a conversationalist. Learn how to talk with people. Don't talk at them. Man, and let me tell you something. Good, good public speakers, people that like to stand on stage and don't mind the spotlight, we're bad at it. We're so bad at it because we're not listening. Learn to listen to people and talk with them not just talk at them. That's why if, if you really want to talk to a pastor and you call, you're going to probably end up getting one of our staff pastors because they're, they're great at having conversations with people. And that's what we try and teach people to be like. Have a conversation with somebody. Listen to it like this. Mark 4, Mark 4, starting in verse 33, Jesus used many similar stories and illustrations. Does that sound like he was talking at people or he was talking with? Let me tell you a story. Man, that's a conversation right there to teach the people as much as they can understand. In fact, his public ministry, he never taught without using parables and stories and illustrations. He loved talking with people. This is as easy as you telling stories about what your faith is like to other people. If you want to know what this looks like in real life, this means like what I just did. You share the good stories and the bad ones. Just tell Tell stories. Tell the people, the people you work with, the people you live by, uh, the other people at school, wherever you're at, just tell stories. Have conversations with people about your faith experience. Just have conversations with people. Don't be, don't be afraid of, of telling like, Ben, I prayed for something that didn't work out, but you know what? I still got hope. Or when something did go through, don't feel like you have to conjure up something to win somebody over. Believe me, when people know that you care about them, They'll, they'll listen to you. They'll listen to what you have to say because you care about them. But you know what else good preaching is like? It's like teaching. This is number two in your bulletin, so go ahead and fill that in. Good preaching is like teaching. Like I said earlier, everybody has something to offer somebody else. A hint, a tip, some advice that will help a person get to where they want to go. And if you think that you don't have something to offer someone else, man, you're friends with the creator of the universe. You got plenty to give. You've got plenty to give. If you've been doing this one day, there's somebody that hasn't been doing it a day. There's somebody who's been doing it an hour that you could give. Like when I was in that program, maybe when I was there a month, I didn't know very much about living for Jesus, but I knew more than the guy who had been there a day, and I could show him how to make it through that first week because I knew that every single person in here, you have something to give somebody else. So don't ever forget that. That don't let insecurity creep in. It's so common that we feel like, man, I don't, well, I'm not doing as good as so-and-so, and I still struggle with this and that. Don't, don't let that get in your way, because there's someone who's struggling 10 times as much, and you can show them how to get to at least where you're at. You have something to give. Don't ever forget that. This is what Jesus said about it in Matthew 28. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, listen to this, I am with you. Notice that about teaching. I am with you. A good teacher 
doesn't just throw facts at somebody's face. It says, here, put your hand right here. Put your hand right here. I will take you there. A good teacher, that's what they do. I got lessons uh, playing drums when I was, I've been a drummer my whole life, so a lot of my stories are about drums. I got lessons when I was first starting, and then after I had been playing for 10 years, I got lessons at that point. And you know what good teachers will do? They'll say, I see where you're at. Here, come with me. I'm going to play this, and then you play it with me. A good teacher will take someone from where they're at to where they want to go. Amen. Now, and that's, that's a key factor. Don't you, it's really hard to teach someone that doesn't want to go where you're trying to take them. <laughs> so if it feels like you're getting a lot of pushback, maybe you've got the wrong student. Don't, don't blame that on yourself. Don't blame that on yourself. If someone doesn't want it, sometimes it's all right to just say, you know what, that's all right. When you're ready, though, I'll be here for you. Be with you. That's what Jesus did. I am with you. Teach the new disciples. Behold, I am with you. Good preaching is also like salt. Good preaching is also like salt. How could good preaching be like salt? You know why good preaching is like salt? Because just the right amount makes everything better. <laughs> just the right amount makes everything better, man. They put, you put a little bit of salt on that steak. I'm getting ready for lunch. I'm gearing up for lunch right now, actually. And I'm thinking about that. Put a little bit of salt on it. Put it on your steak. You put it on your veggies. You know, they got salt in your dessert. They got salt in your drinks. They put salt in everything. Why? Because salt makes everything better. And you know what Jesus said? You are the salt of the earth. You make everything better. You make everything taste a little bit better. The right, just the right amount, you know, a, a pinch. I don't know how much that really is. I'll be like grabbing it and like a whole handful. That's why Tiffany does most of the cooking in our home, you know, because a pinch of salt would be like, I can't eat this, babe. I can't eat this right here. A pinch of salt, a pinch of preaching, a pinch of encouragement at the right time is like salt. And it just makes someone's life taste a little better. Maybe someone's going through something in that moment. And you can be like, you can be like, ah, yeah, my little salt shaker. <laughs> this is my little daughter's salt shaker right here. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? It's like put a little salt on it. Just put a little bit of salt. Salt it into your conversations. Salt Jesus and encouragement into your conversations. I've heard the saying, you know, um, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Yeah, that's, that's, it's good. I know it's good, but use words. Use words. Nothing encourages someone like words. Saying, hey, you know what? You're amazing. It's hard to say that with, you know, a wink, you know. You're like... <laughs> good vibes your way, bro. You know, like I'm sending it, you know, like say something nice to somebody. Say it. Say, use your words. Say, I love you. You are worth it to me. You can do this. Say nice. It's just a little bit of salt. Just a little bit of salt. Makes that steak that you don't even want to eat, turns it into, mm, I love that. Listen to what Jesus says though. It goes on. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? What good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. See, a lot of preachers like me, like not like I'm teaching you everybody to be a preacher, but like preachers that stand up here and stand in front of a lot of people, a lot of preachers like that like to preach, you know, not too much, not too much. Like give them your little bit of faith, but not too much. And you know why we like doing that is because it gives you an out and it's easier to preach that way to just, oh, just a little tiny bit, not too much on you. Just a little tiny bit. That's why we love sayings like, uh, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. And everybody's like, whew, I don't have to say anything. Sweet. But it seems like Jesus was like, what good is it if you can't taste it? Man, let's put some more on here. Man, dump it on there. Let's take the cap off. Let's put it on there. Seems to me like Jesus was a bit of a food ruiner. Like he just loved a lot of salt. What good is it if you can't taste it? That's the caption for Facebook, by the way. It's a picture of me with the thing. Jesus was a food ruiner. That's the, that's, the, that's the caption for Facebook right there. I can feel it in my bones. Please, no. Please, no. I'm looking at my production team like, please, God, please do me a solid one time. Let's not put that out there. Man, there's, there's, enough, there's enough of all that. Anyway, Jesus, Jesus liked a lot of salt. He was like, get in there. Don't worry about, don't worry about too much. Worry about not enough. It doesn't come up in this discourse, not too much, guys. 
not too much. You know what does come up? What good is it if you can't taste it? Man, put it on there. Good preaching is like salt. Don't forget about it. Man, your meal, that sucks. That, the, the day that somebody's going through that's terrible, don't, don't worry about not enough. Don't worry about too much encouragement. Worry about not enough. Worry about not enough. You know what else good preaching is like? Good preaching is like light. Good preaching is like light. Light keeps you from stubbing your toe on the leg of a chair. Light is good. It illuminates the darkness. I could preach a thousand different things right now, but let me tell you something. I was working at the church last night. I came over here, and I still like to just work late into the night, and I was fixing the roof of this drum box, and I took the, the ple- there was plexiglass up there, and I took it down, and I got my, my little saw out, and I, so if there's little pieces of plexiglass out there, that's, that was me. That was me. I got you. And there's a big old slab, like a piece of plywood, and I, I was carrying it. I thought I was, you know, 20-something back then, and I was carrying it like this, and I was up on the stage like this, and I was coming down, and it was dark in here. I didn't have all the lights on. You know, I'm trying to, I mean, I see all the bills. The lights were off. <laughs> Promise you that. All right? And I was there. And there was no AC on either. I see them bills. You know how much city load I? Don't. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it right there. And I had my plexiglass right here. And it was dark. And I was coming down here. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm almost done. And I came down. And it went. And I rolled my ankle right, right here. And you know when you hurt yourself? You know when you hurt yourself on the inside of your body and you can, like, feel it reverberate through? And like, it's like when you're talking with your ears plugged and you can really hear it. Inside, my body was screaming like a girl. I was so hurt right there. But if just a little bit of light, I would have seen, oh, okay, there's a step right there. But let me tell you the, my favorite part about light. My favorite part about light, and good preaching is like light. Um, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I'm a, kind of a science buff. I love science. I love scientific facts. I like proving the Bible with, like, scientific discovery has never, has never refuted the Bible. In fact, it's actually confirmed what the Bible knew thousands of years ago. Science. I love science. I've always loved science. I was very bad in school, but science with all the beakers and the fire and the bubbling and the foaming and the cutting of the frogs, I liked all that. I liked all that. The funny thing about light is you can't have light without warmth. You cannot have light without warmth. There is nothing that you could show me. It's a physical scientific impossibility to have light without warmth. In fact, warmth produces light. That's why when you rev up your car too much and you look under there and that red thing is glowing, that heat creates light. It's the, ma- it's the molecules, it's the atom moving that creates the light. Physically speaking, you cannot have light without warmth. And good preaching is like light. And you know what Jesus said? You are the light of the world. You light things up warmly, warmly. Not cold, not in a cold fashion. You, you illuminate dark places, and this is that correcting and rebuking, that hard stuff. You shine light warmly, warmly. Let me read the scripture for you. Let me read the scripture. Matthew 5, you are the light. You illuminate warmly. And it ain't, it ain't light unless it has warmth attached to it. I mean, we got all these LED. These are all LED lights, all of these. Not those ones. Those are halogens. Those put out lots of heat. But the LED and the fluorescent, I mean, we get better and better at trying to remove as much heat as possible. But you can't have light with no heat. The sun is a ball of heat that produces light. That produces light. And you can try and you can, you can but if, if it's really light, it's warm. If it's, if it's true light, it's warm. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Everyone in the house. See, the, most of this message has been about others, what you're going to do with others, how you're going to affect others. But you know what? Sometimes you've got to preach this word to yourself. Sometimes you've got to preach over yourself. Sometimes you have to light up that lamp in your own house. And it provides light not just for the people in your family, but for you. There's a story I've told many times before, but it it fits here. One time, my wife and I were in a fight, and um, I wanted to get uh, an oil change. And she's like, we don't got money for that right now. We have to wait until our next paycheck. And I I was like, but I'm ready to do it now, so bye. (sighs) So words were exchanged, okay? Pastors exchange words, too. And, we, and I went down to the, to the place to get oil, and, and, and I was walking back. It wasn't that far. And so I drove down, dropped my car off, and I was walking back. And I had just listened to a teaching that was talking about preaching to yourself. 
that was talking about speaking the word over yourself. And you know what I did? I was mad at her. I was mad at her. You know, she's right there looking at me like, careful, buddy. Careful, buddy. <laughs> you better watch it. You better watch it. And I'm walking. And I'm walking. And I, I heard that message. And so I, I was trying it out. And I was like, with my mad face on. You know the one? This one right here. I was mad. People driving down the street looking at me going, Ugh, dude's ugly. God, what makes his face so ugly? And I was walking, mad face, scrunched up. And I was saying, I was saying what I knew was true, but I didn't feel. I said, I, I love my wife. Ugh. She is so beautiful. I just love her so much. And I was walking to my house. And I'm, I'm literally preaching to myself with my ugly face on. And, and you know, every block that went by, I started to get a little bit, I was, because I was saying it, you know, like, she is so beautiful. I love my wife. She is perfect for me. She is my number one. God made her for me. She started, and I started doing this number eight. I was like, yeah, I started to feel it. I was, I was illuminating my own house. I was preaching to my own self, and I brought myself out of that funk, and I walked into that door, and you know, the, you know when you've been fighting a little bit, and you look, you're like, you still mad? I don't know. Are you? Like, you know, you look at back and forth, you're trying to communicate all this stuff. I walked in the door. I'm like, hey, baby, what's up? It's so good to see you. And she's like, what you want, bro? What you want? <laughs> Pee in this cup right here. This is not right. This is not right. You stop by somebody's house on the way home. You ain't right. I was like, yeah, I was fired up because sometimes you've got to preach yourself out of those dark situations. When, when the boss calls and gives that bad news, when the doctor gives you that bad report, when, you're, when your job lets you go or that industry closes, you've got to tell yourself, no, he's my provider. He's got me no matter what. When that doctor's report comes in, you've got to say, you know what? No, he's my healer no matter what, no matter what. If I go to the dirt for this illness, I know I'm going to be with my father in heaven, and he loves me. He's my banner. He's my shelter. He's my shield. You've got to preach this stuff to yourself, people, because you've got to have it to give it. You've got to have it to give it. Do not be embarrassed or ashamed to preach your own self and give yourself a little amen. Hey, amen, Elliot. Yeah, preach it. I'm talking to myself. Preach it. Preach it. It gives light to everyone in the house. That includes you. Let's get back to, let's get back to others. But the best preaching. So good preaching is blah, 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 blah. But the best preaching is like fishing. The best preaching is like fishing. Because there's, there, there's a lot of ways to be good at fishing, man. You get the right lures. You can get the right rod and reel. You can get that fancy $10,000 fish finder. You could be on a boat called the Cracker Jack, and you could be driving all around, and you can have everything. But you know what, what happens when, when you're fishing, man? If you're not in the water, you're not doing it. You're, you're on land. You're not fishing. You're not fishing. We were watching a show uh, like a while back, and uh, there's this one fisherman on this fishing show, and he liked to spend most of his time at the dock. He had a big screen TV underneath his, uh, underneath his boat, and he was, like, he was calling somebody. He was like, hey, man, are the fish biting out there? And the guy who's out there working was like, yeah, they're biting, dude. He's like, well, what coordinates are you at? Where, where are you at? He's like, I'm on the ocean, bro. Where are you? You're on land. You ain't fishing. You just hanging out. Let me tell you something. You gotta put yourself out there a little bit. You've gotta go where the people are. Even, even the little mermaid wanted to go where the people were. <laughs> even she wanted to go where the people were. We need to learn that, you know, if you don't learn to love fish, listen, listen to this. If you don't learn to love fish, you will never be a good fisherman. Because as soon as it comes out the water, you'll be like, what's that smell? It smells like stink. And then you put your hands on it, it's so slimy. Ugh. Not just girls, but guys too. This is slimy, man. I don't want this. You mean I'm supposed to cut it open? Oh, this is messy. If you don't like fish, you'll never be a good fisherman. You know where I'm going with this? You know where I'm going? If you don't love people, you'll never be good at, at being a fisher of men like Jesus said to Peter. Come, follow me. I'll show you how to fish for people. Do you think Peter could have ever been a fisherman if he didn't love the smell of nasty fish? <laughs> Big piles of them. And they're dirty, and they're slimy, and they come walking in with their, with, they smelling like weed when they walk in. And they smelling like they just had a big Saturday night bash on Sunday morning. They coming in with their halter top on, and, and you think Peter would have been a good fisherman? He said, oh, 
John, look at them. Look at them. Oh, here we go again with all that. Mm. Oh, hi. Mm. Good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. It's a good thing you're here. Come on, man. Come on. Is that, is that the way we're going to do this? No. Is that, is that really what we are? No. Is that what we're doing? No, you got to love the smell of dirty, stinky fish, man. You got to love people right where they're at, right where they're at, exactly the way they smell, exactly the way they look, exactly the way they talk. You know what I hate? I hate when I'm going out golfing. I like to golf. Confession time. Confession time. I love to golf. It's one of my favorite things to do, one of my favorite hobbies. And every Monday, I take a little half day off, and I go golfing. It's like I get to, you know, after Sundays, you know, I'm tired and I get to golf out there. And you know what I hate when I tell people what I do? They ask me, inevitably, they ask me, hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm, uh, and now, we ha- now I have the thrift store, so I get to lead in with that. Praise God. Because before, I used to have to just tell them, uh, I'm a pastor of a church. And then I could see the wheels turning in their head. And then they, they stopped being themselves right there. Right then and there, they stop being themselves. And they do a little shuffle and they go, oh, how many parishioners in your parish I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> wow. I'm a, what are you talking about? It's a Catholic thing. Found out later. Um, haven't been saved my whole life. And, um, but I, I watch them, and it happens. And, and then they're thinking, they're thinking to themselves, oh, that joke I just told a minute ago. He's judging me for that. And then immediately I watch them. They stop being themselves. Is that really? And, and, and these people don't even know me. So somewhere in their life, they learned that Christians... You can't be yourself around them. They'll get you. Where did he learn that? I don't know. I know what my job is now, though. I've got to somehow break that down. I've got to somehow let him know. You are allowed to be yourself around me. Please. If you were going to tell a dirty joke, I am not going to. Man, you're not sitting in my church right now. I don't have to tell you that that's a wrong. Man, you be you. I'm going to love you just like that because I love fish. I love the way they smell. I love the way they squirm when you're starting to bring in. They're like, no, I don't want to. You're like, it's all right, baby. Come on in. It's going to be all right. I'm going to take care of you. You can't clean them before you catch them. Please, please. You understand that preaching is like fishing. You got to put it out there. It's like, it's like, do we really think that we do most of our fishing right here in church? It's like, uh-oh, careful. Okay, watch your eyes. Watch your eyes. You know, I'm, this is a safety hazard. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. It's like the only place I fish is bzzz, bloop, in church. A lot of catch and release going on. A lot of catch and release. You ain't really doing anything. We need to put ourselves out there. You know what, God, God, God spoke to me about this because if anybody struggles with it, it's someone who's full-time at a church. You know, I don't even have a place I work where unsafe people are. I've got, to really, I've got to really do something about it. So God spoke to me in, a, in such a way where I knew it was the right thing for me to, to write my messages out in the coffee shops, out in there because I can meet the baristas. I can meet my waitresses. I can talk with them, and they can see what I'm doing. But all of us, we all have our, our, our places where we, can, where, where we can, when's the last time, let me ask you this, when's the last time you went intentionally to a place where fish were? I'm getting my parables mixed up. When's the last time you went to a place where unchurched, unsaved people were just so that you could be around them? Do you love them like that? Mm. It's, it's tough. It's tough because we come in and if we're not careful, we teach ourselves, you know, you got to. You got to sanctify yourself. You got to stay away, man. You got to keep, keep, keep yourself safe. You know, don't, you don't want to put, put yourself in that situation, which is true to, to a point. Like, I'm, I'm a man from recovery. I would never recommend anybody like that would go to a bar or go someplace like that. It's going to put you in danger, okay? I, I'm not suggesting that. And we need to be wise. We need to have our own thing. Like, I would never do that for myself. But I can go to a coffee shop. Like, there are places I can go where I can still be safe and I can be me and I'm not putting myself and my salvation in jeopardy, like I'm not going to go over to like a drug dealer's house and hang out. Well, pastor said I need to be around fish, so, you know, please don't, don't do that. And the same thing can be true not just for drugs, but maybe sexual things. Like you want to you keep some distance if you've ever struggled with anything like this. You want to be careful, but not, don't worry about too much. Worry about not enough. Worry about not enough. We need to be around people. 
because good preaching is like fishing. We got to go where the fish are. You got to plop yourself into an environment where people are. I say plop on purpose because it's like water. You got to plop yourself where the people are. Make your life, speech, and deeds attractive. Preach with your life by the way you live as well. Listen to this in Colossians 4, starting in verse 3. Pray for us too. This is, this is Paul again. Paul wrote a lot of the Bible. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak. There it is. Say something. To speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. He was in, cha- Man, he was in chains a lot when he was getting work done. And he was free as a bird. Free as a bird. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. This is my favorite part. Verse 5. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations, there it is again, with your mouth, be gracious and attractive. I got a question for you. I got a question for you. Do people, especially unsaved, unchurched people, do they love when you're around? Or is your faith a burden to them? You don't have to raise your hand. And you can tell, you can tell when your faith burdens them. If you walk in, do people love being around you? People say uh, churches that focus on new people, churches that focus on being attractive are like bad and shallow, but it sounds more biblical than anything that we would live our lives and conduct ourselves in such a way that we are gracious and attractive. This is, this is the Apostle Paul, gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everybody. Is your Christianity attractive attractive does it cause people to say you know what i like what you got there what are you doing i like that i love it when you're around i always feel better when you come to work i always feel better when my shift is with you i always feel better when i run into you at the golf course because you're always making me feel like i matter you're always making me feel like i am the center of the universe you always make live attractively that's my application for the day Go where people are. Go where unsaved, unchurched people are and live your life attractively. Be generous. Be generous with your words. Be generous with your pocketbook. I don't, be generous, be attractive, be gracious. Let yourself be like the, 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 un, the unexcusable person. Like if your boss was like, gonna need to let somebody go that day, man, I can't let, I can't let them go. They always bring the whole environment up. Let yourself be that person, that you are that attractive and that loving with your words and with your speech. Share your faith with someone. Get more non-Christian friends and let your faith be attractive to them. It's like, it's like this. It's like you receive the cure to a fatal disease but are afraid to be around sick people. That's kind of what it's like. We cannot be afraid to give away what has saved us. Let's not let that happen. You were sick too. Don't forget that. And somebody saved a seat for you. Somebody put a sign out and said, man, this is for somebody who's coming, who's never been here before. Because we love it. And that's the way we want to conduct ourselves. You were sick too. Don't ever forget it. You're no better than anyone. And this is what I want to close with. This is what I want to say to you. If you remember only one thing, and I saved it for the end. If you remember only one thing about my whole message today, it's this. There are people who will die without Jesus unless you speak to them. There are people that I will never meet in your circles. There will people, even if I met them, I wouldn't have permission. I'll run into them at the golf course, but I'm just some preacher to them. You work with them. They know you. And there are some people that will die, and dare I say it, in a, in a church service, they will die and go to hell and suffer for all eternity because we refused I say refuse, that's a strong word, neglected to share what we had, to just put some salt into the conversation, to just share. Don't worry about too much. Worry about not enough. Worry about not enough. There are people who will die unless you share with them your faith. There are people depending on you, and this is is what I want to say. You can do it. You can totally do this. You have exactly what it takes to minister to the people that God has set for you. You are made exactly the way. God will use your shyness, your introvertness to minister to somebody because they won't trust somebody like me. I'm way too loud for all that. They will not. This guy's a joke. They just won't listen to me. And God will use my extrovertness. God will use my 
way of doing it to, to speak to somebody. God will use your love of math. God will use your love of music. God will use your love of science. God will use your whatever you got. God will use you just the way you are to minister to someone that needs it and will never get it without you. Amen. I'm putting the ball in your court this morning. You, you have a job to do on Monday. It might even be today. It might be Sunday afternoon. You have a job to do, and you've got some life to give out. You've got some life to give, and they're not going to get it unless you give it. Are you with me? Yeah. Amen. Let me share with you really quickly. This is, this is, when it comes to that point for me, this is how I like to do it. I use my testimony. I use what I've been through. I use, I'll use anything I can, but this is what I'll do. You know, I, I've, done, I've, done major, I've made major mistakes in my life. I let down my family, I betrayed their trust, I, I stole, I, I'm a felon. You know, I've, I've made major mistakes in my life, but there was one person, there was one person that when I met them, I knew I was accepted and loved, and that changed everything in my life. That person's name was Jesus Christ, and when I met him, everything in my life changed. Everything changed, and I became free once and for all. Everything changed when I met him that day in 2007. In that little rinky-dink chapel at the Salvation Army in downtown Stockton, everything changed that day. When I met him, I thought the air conditioner was on too low because I started to feel it on my skin. And when I met him, everything changed. And I want to let you know right now that he is waiting to have a relationship with you. That's all he really wants. God created us, men and women, so that he could have a family. That's, that's what he really wants. He wants you as son and daughter to come back to him. There's a story in the Bible called the prodigal son. And there was a son who, for one reason or another, left his father, took the inheritance, did a bad thing. And when he wanted to come back, he felt like he's not going to want me. My father is not going to want me. I trampled on his trust. I trampled on how good my father treated me. But when this young man came onto his father's property, his father was outside already. He probably spent every day outside just waiting, tears, just waiting for his, his son to come back. That's all he wanted. This is my son. I, what else am I going to, what am I going to go back to work? My son's out there. And so when the son came back, the father hiked up his stuff and went running towards him. And that's what the father wants to do for every single person here. If you were on the outskirts of faith, your father runs to you. There's a song that every time I hear it, he runs to me. He runs to me. My father runs to me. We like to talk about how we need to run to God and we need to go to him. No, he runs to me. He runs to me. I was coming back like this, barely walking. He runs to me. That's the God I serve. And that's the person I want to introduce you to today. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Our Father, he loves us more than I could explain. I could never explain it good enough. And no matter what your idea of a father is in this natural life, just know that your Father loves you unconditionally. Your Heavenly Father loves you unconditionally and will never trade that love for anything. You could never do anything to remove that love. You could never do anything to actually cause that love to happen. He loved you before you got your act together. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave his life for you while you were in the thick of your addiction or of your greed or of your pride. While you were in the thick of it, he gave his life for you just so that you could have an opportunity to come back to him. And that's what today is all about. Today is all about coming to him coming back to the Father, coming back to the Father. I want to give every single person here opportunity. I want to speak to two groups of people. I want to speak to two groups of people. Maybe you used to have a relationship with God. Maybe you used to have a relationship with God and something happened along the way. Maybe, maybe uh, there was a tragedy. Maybe you got sick. Maybe, maybe there was something like a burden on you and you somehow, some way drifted. You used to have a relationship with him, but you've drifted away from him. But I want to tell you right now that he's been waiting for you to come back. No matter what you did, no matter what you experienced, no matter if it was just negligence, 
no matter if it was just, I just forgot about my, my God. I forgot about my Father in heaven. I want to let you know that he is ready to and willing to accept you right here for exactly who you are and ready to start back up that relationship right now. I want to talk to another group of people. I want to talk to a group of people who, who maybe you've never heard the gospel preached like this. Maybe you've never heard the gospel preached like this and you never knew. You never knew that there was a, a loving father in heaven that, that just loved you unconditionally, that loved you no matter what you did. You've never heard it talked about like this. You've never heard that, that the father just comes running after you. And if, no matter what category you fall into, I want to give you opportunity right now to come back to him, to come back to him or maybe come to him for the first time. So here we go. If that's you, if you want to give your life to Jesus or give your life back to Jesus, on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand to the sky and show me and the Father that you're ready to come to him. One, two, three. If that's you, lift your hand to the sky. Amen. See your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. I see your hands all over the place. And this is my favorite time of the week because right now the Father is receiving his children back to himself. Amen. Come on, clap your hands with me. Come on, clap your hands with me favorite time of the week. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. Now, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. You could keep your heads down, actually, because we're going to pray a little prayer right now. We're going to pray a little prayer. And so keep your heads down, your eyes closed. If you, if you, if you indicated that to me and you want to, you want to give your life to Jesus, we're going to say a prayer right now. And this is your first line of communication. This is, the, this is step one. And then I'll give you some more steps out of this. So this is what I want you to do. Just say the words after me. Say the words after me and pray this prayer like you, like it's from the bottom of your heart. Father God, I give everything I have to you. I thank you for your forgiveness.